Good morning. As Dale said, uh, my name is Massimo Banzi. I'm one of the founders of the Arduino project. Today, I want to tell you a little bit about how Arduino happened, because the, uh, <clears throat> there are some interesting uh, issues in the way Arduino was born, because it wasn't born in a, a sort of technology-oriented context. It wasn't born in an engineering school. It was born in a design school. And one of the things that it's interesting is that I'm Italian, and Italy has a big tradition in design. I mean, you probably sort of know Italian design from chairs and tables and that kind of stuff. But there's a, whole, there's a lot more that sort of goes around in the whole idea of design thinking. And um, the designers uh, in Italy, 50, 60 years ago, they were trying to imagine already how will we, how will we live in the future? How you know, how we, how we will be to live in the future. So they're trying to design and figure out a lot of the issues that now maybe the maker movement is, is facing. These people were thinking about it a lot uh, many years ago. And then I want to kind of touch a little bit on what we are trying to do in the, in the near future. So, okay, for the ones who don't, for the ones who've been on another planet recently, is, <laughs> so Arduino is an open source electronics prototyping platform based on the flexible, easy to use hardware and software. So I'll explain to you later what all this kind of means. But the, so the basic building block is this thing that we call the Arduino Uno. And it's a small little computer that costs around $30. And it's designed to be easier to program than what was available before. Um, this is the team that's sort of behind Arduino. Uh, you have Gianluca on the left who deals with the hardware and manufacturing. Uh, David in the middle who is Spanish but teaches in Sweden. Then is me uh, over there. And then there's Tom Igo who is uh, teaching at the ITP in New York. And you've seen some of his students uh, yesterday. And David Mellis is at the MIT Media Lab and he deals with software. So all of us and our interactions sort of make uh, Arduino. Sometimes our interaction are also some sort of conflicts, but you know, it's an interesting multicultural product of like different, different people getting together. And we also, I want to mention Daniela Antonietti, who is like our CFO. She doesn't like to be, to be in pictures or anything, but she's an incredibly important force that avoids us going bankrupt. So without Daniela, I would probably not be here right now. So the interesting thing, in my opinion, about what, uh, what happened is that I was teaching in this school called the Interaction Design Institute Ivrea. So Ivrea is this little city in the northwest of Italy where this Olivetti company was started and, and existed for almost 100 years. It still exists, but it's kind of the shadow of what it used to be. But it's important because it was one of the first companies in the world to use and adopt design across the line. So the graphic design, the design of the objects, some of the typewriters that Olivetti was making are in Design Museum because they're beautiful, well-designed. Also the way they engineered the whole thing to make it simple. They, in the 50s, they went into computers and they had one of the, probably the first computer that was actually designed by a designer instead of a, an engineer. And so this building here was the R&D building for uh, Olivetti in the 60s. And, they, uh, and the Italian telecom company decided to set up a design school here. But to teach about interaction design. So interaction design, in a way, is this uh, evolution of the kind of classic design, where you don't not always design shapes, not always find solutions for design problems, but you actually design experiences. So how do you design the experience that I have when I interact with a piece of software, uh, the, with a piece of hardware, you know, the, the experience that I have when I'm trying to buy a ticket from the machine in the BART station? You know, that kind of experience, somebody might or might not have designed it, but when there is a designer that applies in, himself or herself to this task, then you get a very nice result. If you look at mobile phones, clearly you can see that some mobile phones are terrible to use, although they might look beautiful. And then you get things like, you know, the iPhone that has been, the user experience has been crafted, you know, very well, and, and you get, you know, it was a breakthrough when it came out. So when, when you apply design to the way you interact with things, it starts to become interesting. Uh, and one important thing about this is that the students that study this, they make prototypes. So the idea is that 
you don't design things by making a foam model of a phone because it doesn't make sense. You have to make something that works. The problem is that when you have a bunch of designers that might not have had any uh, software training or electronics training, you need to find ways to teach them how to use technology without having to become an electronics engineer or without having to become a proper software engineer. So the context for me was very, was very interesting. So, and all the people that you see in the picture, we came together in different capacities as visiting professors and we started to talk. And so, you know, we started to figure out that if you wanted to make, if you wanted to teach in a different way, you have to start working on different tools. So this is a part of a big poster that we made in 2005, and I'll show you the rest of the poster in the next slide, about the different tools that we made at Ivrea to approach that uh, point. So yesterday somebody mentioned the processing programming language. Um, so uh, Lee Moore and Phil mentioned it. They came from MIT, so one of the inventors of processing came to Ivrea as a teacher, and, and so we started to use it to teach, and we realized there was a lot of potential there. So could we transfer that model to, to, to hardware? So first I made a few experiments and different boards, um, like this one, a bad picture, but this is called the Programma 2003, and it's kind of like the grandfather of Arduino. And it was based on a pic chip because it was easy for me to find them in Italy. It was, they were ubiquitous because they were, they were used to hack satellite receivers. So you could find them anywhere. <laughs> so, you know, so they, even the development, or also like uh, this, the PCB, I made it in a company that started selling uh, online uh, PCBs that you could get in 24 hours. And again, they started off as a company providing tools for the satellite hackers. And then they kind of dropped the kind of pirate kind of aspect of their work. And they sort of became like the most important uh, company, I would say one of the most important places in Europe where you get PCBs online. Then a student of mine and Casey Rees made this platform called Wiring, where a lot of the language behind Arduino and the sort of adapting the processing interface uh, adapt, uh, entered Arduino. And then we took this project and we sort of extended it, open sourced it. So we made it open source software and hardware. It wasn't open source back then. And, and we tried to de design it on a simpler scale. We wanted something simpler and cheaper that you could build yourself. And we started to use it to do projects at school. So I'm gonna show you quickly some projects. This is a wallpaper that you can use as a display. So the different pixels are actually made of paper. They can change color with temperature. So there's a network of a few uh, dozens kind of Arduino. It wasn't called Arduino yet, but uh, that actually turn on and off all the pixels. So we made this four meter by two meter prototype that was supposed to go to the Prada store in Beverly Hills. It never went there, but it was great to get the money from Prada to exp exp experiment. <laughs> Then we started to make this interactive installation for kids. This is uh, like a virtual fish tank where the kids can interact with you know, fish that's projected from above. I made this exhibition for a fancy sunglasses manufacturer. So, you know, we use this product to teach, but also to make uh, uh, some, some of these are missing. So also we made a project for this company called Artemida that makes expensive sort of design lamps in Italy, but we explored interfaces with them. This is a light interface I made in London. I, unfortunately, in the export to PowerPoint, we lost a lot of stuff, not a problem. So I want to touch quickly to me what are the four elements of Arduino. So you get the open source hardware, so the design of a board that you can download. So when we, when we made Arduino, we decided that it was a good idea to just put it online and let people kind of uh, take this um, uh, design of the board and use it and make something out of it. We wanted people to make their own. We wanted people to make their own extension. And at the moment when we did, it was kind of new. There wasn't a lot of people doing open source hardware and a lot of the stuff that was available was very technical and this was like incredibly simple. So we got a lot of abuse online because of the simplicity of the circuit, but if, you know, that's, that's important. The, the thing has to be incredibly simple. You don't need very complex hardware in order to do cool projects. Then we had an open source software that you could use to program the board, and that's derived from the processing language. One of the features that we wanted is cross-platform. Like a lot of designers, they want to use Macs. They don't want to see Windows. They don't want to, they don't want to even touch Linux. So, 
they want stuff. Have, and the problem is that there was not a lot of tools available on, on Macs. There was this article from the MIT, how, uh, how to simply program your AVR on a Mac. And it was like a one kilometer long page. <laughs> they started off with you compiling your own GCC. So I could see my students go, yeah, right. You know, they're going to sit down and compile their own GCC. And then after two weeks, they're going to blink an LED. That's like excitement and <laughs> rapid you know, satisfaction. And, uh, then we sort of worked on a, on a teaching method, which is based on like it's hands on. And then the community, I'll talk about it in a second. But the idea is that then we ended up with something where the hardware is released as Creative Commons. The software is GPL or LGPL. And the documentation is also released as a Creative Commons share alike. And then we decided, OK, we're going to keep the brand, and we're going to trademark that. And that's going to be the only indication that we sort of endorse a certain product. So that if you buy an Arduino that says Arduino, unless you're on eBay, and then you're probably buying a Chinese clone that looks really bad and smells really bad. So <laughs> if it smells really bad when it gets to you in Europe or the US, imagine the factory. Imagine the factory where they made it. So, and also we decided that we wanted to continue making it in Italy. It's like completely counterintuitive, and people keep saying to us, ah, oh, what the hell, just do it in China. Actually, no. As, as Dale mentioned, because of the Olivetti factory, when Olivetti sort of started to fall apart, people kind of spinned off, and they created their own tiny companies. And Italy works very well when the companies are small, because they're very dynamic. A company with 10 people can adjust its, itself to the changes in the world very quickly. They can reinvent themselves every day. A company with 10,000 employees can only crash and burn when the things change. <laughs> so the system in Italy flies because it's like thousands, hundreds of thousands of these tiny companies that every day they wake up and go like, OK, how do I survive today? I'm going to invent this thing. So in a way, there is this fabric in the territory, you know, the micro factories that uh, we see before. In the area near Torino, it, there, there is Fiat. And, and there's lots of these micro factories of people that can make you a car from end to end, finished, ready to. It's full of those people. They used to work at Fiat. They just spinned off and did their own thing. Um, so we try to take care of the design of the object itself. Again, we're coming from the design world. We like to sort of experiment with the way. And also, one of the things that was nice when Dale came, so the guy that makes the PCB explained to us all the different things. I didn't, I didn't even know that we used two different colors white for the two sides of the Arduino, because one color white works better on details, and the other color white is better on bigger surfaces. But it's that kind of level of passion and sort of, you know, almost, it, it's almost pathological passion of, about. <laughs> your product, you know, thinking that PCBs are the best thing in the world, you know, and talking for hours about it, you know. But that's the kind of like quality that we like from these people we work with. It's nice to know that there are about 20 families in Italy that are living because people are buying Arduinos. And, and to me, it's, that's probably the best uh, satisfaction to see there are people that are actually living because of something that we made. So. The community is very important. We started off with like a very basic website, but we started off with a wiki right away. And uh, this is because in a previous life, I was working in software, and I was one of the people that experimented with this, uh, uh, what they call extreme programming. And one of the inventors of extreme programming is actually the guy who invented the wiki concept. So the idea that you could set up a website that everybody could edit was, was kind of something I, I had experienced before. So we just started with that. But then we created this, yeah, this, this, this wiki called the Playground. And anybody can edit and create tutorials in their own language, in a way. And so one of the interesting things that happened is that people started to take Arduino and make their own version. This is from a Chinese company that make their own version of Arduino. People who make it by, by hand. This is some people in Chile years ago. They wanted to do a workshop, didn't have the money to buy it from uh, the US, which is the closest. Uh, and they, they make them themselves. Or companies that make modules that go on Arduino. This is a French company. So the whole ecosystem, I'm not going to go into detail, but it's about us sort of designing this stuff and working with manufacturers and the community sort of helping and people. Uh, 
Um, I'm going to skip a couple of things. And, and collaborating. And the, the idea is that you get companies that then start to use Arduino to derive their own things. So you get this um, Google use it to make the Android uh, ADK. Then you get the um, DIY drones. This is, for example, a, something you would use in the process of analyzing DNA, and it's got an Arduino. MakerBots have got Arduinos and also Ultimakers. So in a way, we did try to apply design a lot in what we do and the design of the boards themselves and the communication behind it in order to sort of make it less dramatic, less, you know, professional, in a way more playful, and try to start to look at a lot of the little details to make it, in a way, simple for people. And we try as much as possible. And also to curate things like this tape that goes around the box so that to communicate the fact, you know, open source is important. So at Maker Faire, you will see we're going to launch this new Leonardo Arduino and uh, this new Wi-Fi module. And we're, at Maker Faire, we're going to give away for free this new Arduino Due so that people can join our project. The Arduino Due is the new Arduino based on a 32-bit ARM processor. We want people to join. So one of the things that we're working on is this robot system that to me is interesting as part of the educational strategy. And again, we're making a lot of work to make it manufacture it in Italy with all the plastic parts uh, designed and engineered in Italy. One thing that is, for me, important in the future is this concept of ob object-oriented hardware. This idea that you can distribute computing into modules and modules talk to each other uh, by using common and open protocols. So this has been touched by a number of people, but you know, to me, the, the future of Arduino is not building a bigger Arduino, but to create systems of smaller Arduinos that kind of communicate with each other in different ways, uh, and that simplify the adoption of a certain piece of technology, something that you just plug in and it just works without uh, previous knowledge, without software libraries, without nothing. So this is something that we're going to be working more in the future, and I'll have more announcements at the next Maker Faire. Um, so this is the current incarnation of that concept, the Tinker Kit that we have been developing since 2006. Modular electronics that you plug, uh, and it sort of takes away the need to know about electronics. And one thing that it's the last thing I want to talk about is that we created this space in Torino that essentially is an Arduino office plus a makerspace plus a fab lab. So it's a combination of different uh, things so that Arduino can basically start to work with local communities. And we are planning to build more of these, so be more located in different places. We have plans to do it in Sweden, in India, Brazil, Spain. So these projects are all kind of going in slowly in each direction. But also one thing that we wanted to do, this is the place. Um, is that now we're crowdfunding the creation of 15 of these places in Italy. So we're basically saying to people, give us 100 euros and we'll make one in your, we'll help you make one in your area. Because we learned so much about doing this thing that we want to basically give the opportunity to people to do it in their own community. So we're gonna give them our knowledge. And we believe in like creating communities that are both online but also connected to the local reality, because the same way that in Ivrea there's all these cool companies doing crazy things, but nobody knows about them, all over Italy, all over Europe, all over the world, there are small companies that are doing great stuff, but you don't get in touch with them. So with this kind of combination of like us getting involved in local communities, um, we want to get in touch with these uh, uh, people. We want to create a flow between them and the online community. So I guess this is one of the things that will keep us busy in the next uh, months, at least uh, uh, in Europe. Um, yeah, so in a way, the idea is that I think it's interesting when you build technology, but you start from a point of view which is not technology. So I think Arduino worked out very well because it was, came from a completely different context. It came from design. And uh, so I think there's a lot more uh, possibilities for developing technology platforms uh, f f with the sort of imp uh, impulse, with the inspiration coming from places that are not full of engineers. Engineers are good. I'm kind of studied as an engineer myself. But it's useful to basically work with other people. 
So uh, this is more or less what I wanted to <laughs> say. And um, you know, if you have more questions, just stop me and, uh, and, and talk to me. Thank you.